I picked this talk, uh, this title, because I think that something fundamentally different has happened in the last 15 years about the way uh, humans are doing science. I think that for 100,000 years they've been doing science in one way, but now that something fundamentally is changing and not many people are actually even able to realize it. So I'm going to throw it at you, see what you think, and you know, it's just my uh, interpretation of something that's going on, but maybe completely wrong. So, traditional science is a hypothesis-driven science. Traditionally, a pro it's science was a process of generating new knowledge through testing different hypotheses. And hypotheses are just research questions or ideas that were traditionally derived from the knowledge that was already there. So you, you had to have some pre-existing knowledge. You would learn about it. You would then use it to generate your own better ideas. And then you would test whether uh, you were right, more likely to be right or wrong. If you're more, more likely to be right, then you would advance the knowledge a little bit. And, and that's how we know what we know. And scientists would be individuals who first they needed to be educated, all right? They, they needed to, to know this existing knowledge. Otherwise, if you're just throwing ideas without knowing what's already known, you're just looking stupid. Sometimes you're lucky and you get something right, but otherwise most, mostly you can't convince anyone that you're uh, serious. So you first need to have some education, this is why you're here, and you also need to be imaginative and creative to start posing some research questions and design experiments. So you pose a question, you design your experiment, and then you perform some measurements and generate information that can tell you whether you are right or you are wrong. So if you confirm your hypothesis, this generates new knowledge and improved understanding of the nature in comparison to what we had before. Now, let's, let me give you two questions which you should start think as early as possible because the trouble is that most scientists never actually think about these things until it's far too late and then they realize it when they're about to retire. So what really makes an area of science successful and what makes a scientist successful? Let's, let's think. So today we know from what physicists tell us that we live in an 11 dimensional universe which is probably a hologram which is being projected from black holes and, and, and going away from us faster than the speed of light and this is why we can't uh, see the borders of it, you know? So um, it's all being projected from the two-dimensional surface of uh, black holes and it's all mathematically consistent with this theory. So we didn't evolve to understand that, we evolved to survive on a very thin crust of a cooled crust of a tiny planet which inside has lava, we can't survive there. If you go 10 miles up you can't even breathe anymore. So we can only inhabit very very tiny crust in this huge universe of one small planet and, and we're, you know, developed, evolved to have five senses which are helping us to survive. You know, we can see something, smell, hear, taste, touch. That's pretty much all we can do. So this is how we can learn about our world, trying to get these senses to give us information integrated in the brain and trying to make sense of the world we live in, right? But the trouble is that our senses evolved to, to help us to survive on the planet, not to understand the universe. So if you just trust your senses, you will, it will seem, the world will seem flat, right? And the sun looks like it's going around us and the moon it's looks like it's going around us. So, because you don't understand what, you, what you're experiencing and, and early humans didn't, you know, that raises fear of the unknown uh, things. And, and because of this fear of the things that they didn't understand, like the thunder or the this or the that, they, they make a god of thunder, god of this, god of that, god of that. Okay, but um, any explanation that they could offer, even in form of uh, religion or uh, some system of beliefs or a legend, would actually uh, be helpful and this is why people accepted them. And those legends were actually the first scientific hypothesis. They were generated, so they fit all the definition that I said is a scientific hypothesis. You have to generate it by the imagination of the individuals of that time in an attempt to explain the unknown in the nature using the pre-existing knowledge. And now to make this even more boring and, um, <laughs> and, and more uh, uh, simple, uh, elementary school level, Native American Indians have this lovely story of this guy, I can't pronounce the name, and the origin of the moon. So, you know, they, they were looking at the moon, they didn't know how 
it got there and now you can read it that there was no moon only the sun and the creator so they had some some creator there you know they, they thought of a they used creator to explain things that they didn't understand had two children boy or girl living in the sky world so they thought of a sky world to explain you know all the stars and everything so the daughter looked after them all when she shook the feather bedding the feathers would fall to the earth as a snow so this explained the snow they used something they knew uh, you know the feathers that look like a snow to explain the snow the sun hunted and fished he hung his net to dry droplets fell to earth as rain so they explain the rain like this right the father would be away of all day keeping the great fire burning on the sun so the sun was some great fire kept by some uh, their, their father right he was very old and he said to them when i die you must keep the fire burning or the people and animals will die on the earth right on day uh, one day the father came home tired died that night in the morning it was time to start the son's fire but the children began to quarrel who will start the fire i will tend the fire i'm older so said the sister no i'm the man i will do it said the brother so the people on earth began to worry why is the sun so late it should be up by now and then this guy uh, went to the sun to see what's happening and when he arrived the boy and sister were still quarreling and he was angry the people and animals will perish, he said to them. You should keep the fire burning, he told the boy. And to the sister, you too will work as hard as your brother, but you will keep the fire in another place. You will work at night. You will be the moon. And the two of you did not get along, and as a punishment, you will only see each other once a year. And so it happened, and even now it's so. So you see, they used some knowledge that they had. They knew that, you know, droplets are coming from the net, that the fire looks like the sun. And they basically, this, this is a valid scientific hypothesis. This is a valid explanation at the time of the sun and the moon and the rain and the snow, because they had some limited knowledge and we still all have very limited knowledge don't forget that we're in 21st century sometimes in the 50th century they're going to talk about this ridiculous 21st century scientists like yuri alchenko and you know igor and dodren who you know had no idea about this and no idea about that well we're going to seem to 50th century science it's just exactly like this american indians are seeming to us today, you know, we're going to look ridiculously simplistic in our understanding and using our understanding to explain the natural phenomena. Maybe we are further away than today than, than these guys were, but we're nowhere near understanding, you know, most of what's going on uh, um, today, right? Okay, so as you can see, traditional science, hypothesis-driven science, uh, let, let's, let's make up a hundred-year-old example. Early humans living in caves and they were faced with two competing hypotheses. This is how research works, okay? You have two hypotheses. One is always that there is no difference between any two places on Earth in terms of their hospitality to early humans. And then you can have an alternative hypothesis which negates the previous one, which is that there would be places which are much more hospitable than the current habitat or the cave. So these two ideas were in competition with each other and mutually exclusive. And which one is right? Well, you don't know. When you don't know anything about it, then there is a 50% ch chance that one is right and 50% chance that another one is right. So you start with assigning 50% likelihood to this one and 50% likelihood to that one. If you say, nah, it's not, it can't be 50%, that means that you already must know something and are using already some information that you are having to say, no, 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 this is like 80% likely and this is 20% likely. So as soon as you know anything, you, you have any knowledge or information to add, you are changing the probability that these hypotheses are right or wrong. So if you know nothing, I know nothing about how tall are, you know, violets on Jupiter, if they are, are any, or are, actually are there any violets on Jupiter? I don't know, no one's been there, no one's checked because it's all in the clouds. So maybe there are, maybe they're not, so it's 50-50. But if I sent a, you know, a, a spaceship to Jupiter and scanned the surface and saw nothing, then it would dramatically increase the likelihood that there's no violets on Jupiter, right? <clears throat> okay, so what do you need to do to, to give more likelihood to one hypothesis than the other? You have to conduct an experiment. So you need to gather new information which would support one hypothesis and invalidate the other. Until then, each one is 50% likely. So the scientists of that time, which is the cavemen, would just go around and spend weeks or months exploring different other places and check if they were safer and more hospital or more generous with food and water. So if they found that everywhere else is exactly the same, it's like if they were in Arizona or Siberia, you know, they would probably not find anything different than they were. That's a negative 
result h0, h0 is correct. If there is at least one clearly better place, then it's a positive result, so h1 is correct. And then after the journey, what do they do? They come back to their village, their tribe, whatever, cave, and they have to communicate their positive result. Because seeing something and understanding and knowing is just one thing that you do in science. Oh, hmm, good, I found something. But then you have to communicate it to others in the tribe. But those in the tribe may believe you or they may say like, yeah, right, I don't believe you. So if the senior members who lead the tribe are too rigid or narrow-minded or jealous, they may not even want to hear the suggestion or consider it properly. So you have this bunch of guys, young guys, you know, in their teens, coming back to the village and said, we found far, far better place, like Timon in this uh, Timon and Pumba uh, cartoon, <laughs> came to his meerkats who were digging and said, like, you don't have to dig anymore, let's go there. But nobody believes them, right? So if the seniors are jealous of these guys or, or don't want to give them importance, they're going to say, like, yeah, right. So as a great German, as Nobel Prize winner, and your homework is to figure out which one, once said, the science doesn't move forward because, uh, you know, the scientists, uh, the old scientists change their um, beliefs. They, they, it moves forward because the old scientists die. And that's the only reason why we got where we are, because old scientists are not going to change their beliefs. They're going to have to die for, for new ideas sometimes to, to be picked up. But if they're wise, they would visit those places themselves in an attempt to verify and validate or replicate this finding. And if they're convinced, then they would invite everyone else to also check and accept it, the validated findings as the new knowledge. So now you generated new knowledge. So finding is one thing, but it doesn't represent knowledge. And I'll come back to that several times. It seems obvious to you knowledge is something absolute. No, knowledge is not absolute. Knowledge keeps changing all the time. And knowledge is only what we all agree as humans to believe until somebody comes with a better idea. So then the new knowledge has to be translated into a plan to move the tribe to the new location. So again, as a scientist, you will think, oh, I got the paper in nature. Yeah, that's all I needed to do. No, it's not. The purpose of science to be successful it, is that you translate this, uh, what you found, into some plan to do something different from now. Otherwise, you're generating knowledge, but no one's using it. What's, what's the point? It's like not having it at all. And in the final step of the process, the plan was implemented and everybody moved and resettled to a new location. This implementation has greatly improved the prospects of the tribe. At the new lo location, they lived longer, safer lives. Their children were more likely to survive. The colony grew and prospered. And this is the sign of a successful science. So science is not there just so that we understand things. It's also there to help us to live longer, better, safer, healthier, happier lives, right? And not just to, 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 to publish a paper in nature. That's just a step in what science should be about. Unfortunately, it's far too frequently forgotten. And we keep expanding the, you know, uh, the border towards the unknown by adding more and more uh, knowledge. But nobody ever takes time to actually try to think how to use this knowledge or implement it uh, for the you know, society. So all these main principles will still apply even to the most progressive areas of hypothesis-driven science today. This research will always start with a question or idea which is derived from the existing knowledge. Then you use the imagination to offer a new or more accurate interpretation of nature and what really happens. And this interpretation may or may not be true, but it's going to be different from what people thought. And then you design an experiment to compare the competing hypothesis. You gather the data, you analyze the data to see which hypothesis fits more accurately with the observation. And then the one that fits is accepted, the others are rejected. If the accepted hypothesis is something new, then the new knowledge has been generated, right? And once it's verified by other scientists and accepted widely, then it becomes new knowledge. So science creates, generate, no, not creates, science generates new knowledge through a process of proposing ideas of better interpretation of the nature or, or something that no one's thought of, and then proving that that interpretation is better based on some data that you, uh, you know, collect than the previous one. And then you have to translate it into implementable action or intervention or product, and then the humanity becomes better off than it was before having that knowledge. So it all seems extremely simple and obvious and logical, but believe me, uh, uh, if you look at today's health research system or any research system, you know, it is none of this is actually respected. It deviates from it at ev almost every single point. 
So back to the question, what makes an area of science successful in comparison to other uh, fields of research? Let's think. So, if the science attracts many of the bright people who will use their knowledge and imagination to propose and test many research questions, then it's successful. So, one sign of a successful science is that all the best top graduates, all the best students want to go into genetics and immunology and nobody wants to go into archaeology, for example. So, you know, um, so there is always a part of science which attracts the brightest people and there is always the next big thing that everybody wants to be a part of. So whether it's epigenetics at the moment or this or that, there is always a fashion in science, all right? And, and th this attracts young, good people. Then, intensity of discovery needs to be high. So what does this mean? Uh, that means that a lot of new knowledge is being generated in a short period of time because in some areas of science it takes decades to make some progress, sometimes nothing happens a lot, but if you have a lot of people working then, then it's, um, it's more likely that the intensity is high. Then the discoveries are going to be typically replicated very quickly. It's not going to take ages for something to be replicated and then uh, accepted. Then whenever proven the entire research community will accept it without much resistance. And then there will be a well-developed pipeline for translation and implementation of this knowledge for the benefit of humanity. So what makes a science unsuccessful then? Well, obstruction at each of these five levels. So if you, if, if you can't get the good people to join the science, the science is on its way down. It's not going to be uh, very successful. We, we shouldn't expect much of it, you know, in the future decades. Also, if it takes decades for one serious discovery, then it's not going to be very uh, interesting. Also, if it doesn't have enough people to replicate the findings or if there are two or three people at the top of this science which are preventing any new ideas, then that's bad for the science. And finally, it has to show the humanity that there's some use of that uh, science, otherwise no one's going to uh, fund it. Okay, so early humans could have been even more successful if they could use some tools to help them in their research rather than just two legs and five senses and their brain. So in search for better habitats, they could have used binoculars, all right, that would help them see more things in the unit of time, or off-road vehicle, or even satellite imagery that would, that would help phenomenally in finding a better habitat in Siberia or Arizona than just walking around the desert or the uh, whatever, right? So tools uh, could get them a lot more information in the same amount of time, and their decision to accept the alternative place would have been made based on far greater quantity and quality of evidence and they would have more confidence in their decision. So research tools and research technologies are allowing us to extend the potential of our five senses because the trouble is that we only see visible light but there's all sorts of rays going around which we can't see. We can't see in the dark, we can't see you know, uh, x-rays or this or that. So um, uh, if we could have more senses we could understand nature much better. Now, uh, bats, for example, have echolocation, right? They interpret the reflected sound. Sharks and stingrays have electroception. They can sense changes in electric potential in there around them. Birds and bees have magnetoception. They always go south and then they come back uh, north. So you see, we're, it's, our five senses are not the only five senses which you can uh, use to explore nature. You can, you can develop further senses and some of them did, right? So what did we develop to extend our potential to uh, understand the nature? We developed telescope, radar, sonar, spectrometer, atomic clock, polymerase chain reaction, large hadron collider. Those are all tools that help us to understand the nature which we live in, right? We can't possibly understand the nature without these uh, things that are objective and that extend our senses. So remember this, the critical stage in development of any area of science, so if you feel that you can develop some area of science, it is all going to depend on one thing, which is find a way to objectively measure the phenomena of interest. And sometimes these measurements actually interfere with the phenomena itself, so you have to worry about that. So remember this, if you feel that you're onto something and you want to develop it, why did Gordon now suddenly, why is he doing so well with all these glycans and getting all these projects? Because he has managed to convince the world that all these HPLC uh, and, and other, um, you know, mass spec and so on are actually measuring and are replicable and we can believe the results that come from these kinds of uh, measurements, all right? So, now, in traditional hypothesis-driven science, let's, we, we, we now realized what makes 
a science, an area of science successful. Now let's ask ourselves, what makes a scientist successful in comparison to other scientists? And this should be even of more interest to you than just the science. So the scientist that achieved greatness did it through one of these three uh, ways. And if you can find another way, tell me about it, please. But I mean, these are the three that seem to work. All right. Number one. They either use the existing knowledge of their time in a particularly clever, innovative or creative way to offer an idea that no one else thought of previously before they did. And that's it. Sometimes that was enough. Just offer a big idea that no one else could have possibly you know, um, uh, thought of. For example, Juan Maldaquena has um, said the universe is a hologram. No, universe is a hologram. You know, we live in a hologram. So, boop. Nobody else thought that before. Okay, and now they're fig figuring out the ways how to prove it or disprove it. Um, okay, or, and, and he doesn't have to do it himself because if they prove it, then he's going to get his Nobel Prize, all right? Now, he or she may have designed a particularly innovative way to generate data or conduct some experiment to confirm either his hypothesis or another scientist's hypothesis. So you can actually get uh, big just by you know, taking an old idea that wasn't around like uh, homeopathy or astrology and, and then you know, somebody developed this and it was around but if you can find a way to prove that it actually works then you actually um, uh, get uh, recognized. Or finally, he or she may have developed a tool or technology that offered researchers new senses beyond the five that we have that allow studying the nature and confirming other scientists' hypotheses. So that's the third thing. Give us another sense. You know, we have five. Give us another sense so that we can sense and look at something that we can't uh, experience uh, with our senses and then you're going to get the Nobel Prize. Now let me try to convince you that this is all True. Let's just scan through the history of science and few great scientists and you will tell me whether they were um, uh, famous for uh, you know, offering a big new idea or for uh, designing an experiment to uh, confirm somebody else's idea or for developing a new uh, tool. So it's one of those three and sometimes two or three altogether. So Aristoteles was the biggest one. So he said the world may not be flat. So obviously he was the one who was recognized for the idea. Nobody before him of, uh, proposed that the world may not be flat. But why did he think that? How did he use the existing knowledge of the time to suddenly think that the world may not be flat? Hmm? Anyone? I got into the student or... Anyone? <laughs> so he observed shapes going away from... Exactly. Moment. He showed it basically the lowest part Exactly. Exactly. So there were ships sailing in old Greece, right? And they were sailing away from the shore and then they were disappearing. But firstly, the bottom part and then the sails. How could you possibly explain this? Because the water always, you know, uh, is, uh, you know, like flat, right? So how in the world would that happen if the world was flat? But then it was a big, so, so he used existing knowledge to generate an idea that nobody else previously thought. Everybody else could see that, but nobody thought, hmm, that may mean that the world may not be flat. So Eratosthenes of Siren tested it. How did he test it? Anyone knows? He was in Egypt, close to equator. Okay, you know. <laughs> All right. Okay, so basically, you know, if, if the sun rays come to the earth perpendicular to each other and you're in, in, in Aswan or Alexandria, then there is a, you know, the, the, the stick of the same length would have a, a different, um, uh, what, what is it called, uh, shadow, right? So the shadow had, and he actually, uh, um, he calculated from two sticks in, Eratos in uh, two uh, Egypt cities and from the distance between the cities, he calculated that the earth must be around 40, 41,000 kilometers. So he missed by about 1,000 kilometer even then. So you can see that clever people can actually always find ways to test uh, good ideas. Magellan was actually also testing it by saying, look, I don't believe all that crap. I'm just going to, uh, if the world is, not, is round, I'm just going to circumnavigate it. Unfortunately, he got killed uh, during the expedition uh, in Philippines, but um, oh well. But he was a great man. Now, Copernicus 
Copernicus had an even more bizarre idea that the Earth may not be the center of the universe. And how did he figure that out? Well, he was observing how the night sky is moving around, and he realized that the Earth must have at least two motions. And he was right, actually. So one is around itself, and the one is you know, around the, the sun. Uh, so he figured out we can't possibly be the center of the universe. We are actually moving around something else and around ourselves. So he published seven different hypotheses. That he published them only one year before he died because he was too scared of what church will do to him if he publishes it sooner. But then Galilei developed a telescope and, uh, and tested this hypothesis. And he realized that actually it is exactly like Copernicus said. And then he got in trouble uh, with the church uh, instead, right? And then there was Girolamo Fracastro. He has this big idea. He said, you know, because in, if you were living in, in medieval uh, Europe in some village, you were constantly having one third of the people wiped away by some diseases and, and nobody knew what these diseases were. So he said that diseases may be actually caused by some living particles that are, you know, too small for us to see. And that was amazing because nobody before him said that there may be something that is too small for us to see that, that can actually have some effect on us, right? So, because you would think like, like you can see the ant, it can't do anything to you really, right? So, and, and, and then, you know, how, why would anyone think that there may be something that's much, much smaller that can cause you a lot of harm, right? So he was the first one saying this, but he couldn't prove it. But then Anthony van Leeuwenhoek, he was the guy who developed the tool, the microscope, right? And then he could look into the uh, bones and he could see these little things moving about and around in the past, you know, and uh, actually he was really uh, surprised that this is true you know, because he didn't really expect to see anything but the inner structure, but he saw living organisms moving and, uh, you know, even uh, duplicating and so on. So that was um, um, uh, Leeuwenhoek. And then Jenner was a guy who was, you know, using again the existing knowledge, which is that the milkmaids never get the smallpox. Why do milk milkmaids never get uh, smallpox in the village? Everybody else always gets it and ki ki kids die, but milkmaids seem to be protected. So he thought maybe cowpox, which they get in their blisters, actually somehow protects from smallpox. So he he, he vaccinated uh, some kids in the village with <laughs> cowpox under their skin, thinking that this may protect them from smallpox. Today, he wouldn't get ethical approval for anything like this anywhere near. But in those days, he was like, no, I'm a little bit of this. Look, I come here, guys, candy, white van, and so on. And then, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and the guy protected them from from smallpox, um, uh, remarkably, right? So, uh, so this guy has saved more lives than anyone else in, in history because vaccination has saved uh, hundreds of millions of people since, since then, right? Now, um, so Jenner is, has been quite a cool guy, actually, right? And he was a general practitioner in England, only a general practitioner, imagine that. Now, Jon Snow um, had an idea that it was poisoned water that so, so what did Jenner do, actually? He not only had an idea, but he has actually conducted an experiment. So he didn't develop any tools, but he both had an idea and conducted experiments. These guys either had an idea or developed a tool uh, or an experiment. But this guy did two things. OK, so he's leading at the moment, and he saved many, many lives. Jenner, um, uh, right, Snow, he had an idea that poisoned water may be responsible for cholera in London, and he has designed this study around the pump, you know, looking at the cases everywhere around London, and he figured out it must be this pump of water. And then, uh, so he has both had an idea and designed an experiment as well. James Lynn did the same thing. He thought that somehow citrus may uh, prevent scurvy in the Navy. Scurvy was a huge problem in the Navy, and the Great Britain was leading the world and ruling the world using its phenomenally organized uh, navy and ships. But the people would get scurvy, awful, awful disease. And he just uh, did a trial. He gave some of them lemon, some of them didn't. And these guys didn't uh, get scurvy. So that was the first randomized controlled trial. Um, uh, and um, uh, he's, he's, he's had an idea and conducted an experiment, all right? Darwin, my all-time hero and favorite, what did he have? An, he had an idea that all living species on Earth may have a common ancestral origin. This is a huge idea. This is probably the biggest idea that anyone's ever, you know, conceived in his brain in, in, um, in the history of 
humanity, that everything that you see around us, trees, plants, this all may come from a common ancestor. And then not only that he had this idea, but the poor guy, although he was really seasick, he went <laughs> on a beagle expedition for five years, he was just vomiting on the ship, but every time he touched the earth, he was collecting all this evidence all over the world to support his hypothesis. And this, this is unbelievable what, what the guy has done. So he has not just had an idea, but also conducted a five-year-long expedition, experiment, and also developed many tools that uh, you know, could compare um, how different organisms look like. So to me, to me, he's the man, you know, he, he's the biggest, probably. Now, Thor Heyerdahl isn't as well known, but he's also done something similar. He, he was a social uh, anthropologist who uh, thought that Pacific Island, nobody could figure out how could anyone possibly inhabit Pacific Islands and whether it was this fast train hypothesis, you know, island hopping from, from Malaysia and, uh, you know, uh, Philippines and so on, or did they uh, uh, sail against the wind from South America? And, and everybody thought, well, they must have just gone. But he said, no, 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 it's, it's probably um, uh, South America. So, so not only he has had this idea that it was, uh, that the Eastern, Easter Islands or the others were inhabited from uh, different part of the world, but also he has developed a tool which was Kontiki. You must have heard of the raft that he built which resembled the rafts of the early humans and then he actually conducted an experiment and tried to sail there himself from Chile or Peru or wherever and actually he made it there. So, um, so he, uh, you have to respect that he had an idea and built a tool and, uh, and conducted an experiment, all three. Good. Now Sigmund Freud, great, great mind, he said that human psyche is divided into conscious, subconscious, unconscious, and preconscious. And not only the idea, but he developed the psychoanalysis tools and he conducted many experiments. So another all-time greats did all three things. Einstein didn't bother about the tools or even conducting experiments. He was just all in the brain. And he said there is a space-time continuum and the gravity will, in this continuum, bend the light that's coming from the stars. And that's all, you know, okay? You know, there is a, this, this explains everything in, 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 the, in the modern physics. So, um, he didn't want to bother with proving any of that, of course, because he was a bit like me, you know, uh, tiny and uh, lazy. So, um, uh, so basically, um, uh, there was Arthur Eddington who went to, where was it, Sao Tome and Principe in the west coast of Africa and also another expedition to Brazil, which were waiting for the perfect uh, eclipse, total eclipse of the sun, because then they should have seen that the uh, stars that usually t you see typically somewhere else would, because the sun's you know, gravity would bend the light, would appear somewhere else on the um, horizon. So basically he has proven the Einstein's uh, hypothesis, and then this is when, then, uh, when Einstein really became uh, famous. And then we had our Edinburgh uh, guy, really bizarre guy, who, <laughs> who is a lovely, adorable, adorable person, Peter Higgs, who was uh, blissfully, you know, walking around the Highlands uh, when they were deciding on his Nobel uh, Prize a few uh, months ago and they were delaying announcement of the Nobel Prize because nobody could get him on the mobile phone. If they asked us in Edinburgh, we would tell them that he doesn't even know how to respond to a <laughs> mobile phone because he doesn't uh, carry it around. And, and he heard when he came to the pub uh, in Highlands from somebody there like, oh, aren't you Peter Higgs? You just won the Nobel Prize. Oh, oh that's nice. Thank you. So, um, so he said in 29 that, uh, no, no, he said somewhere uh, that the broken symmetry in electroweak theory could explain the origin of mass of elementary particles. And then it took 50 years and thousands of physicists working at CERN, uh, you know, 3,000 in one team and a few thousand in another team, uh, to, and, and the Large Hadron Collider to be built, you know, underneath Geneva of miles in diameter to actually test this crazy hypothesis and in fact prove that he was right and this is how elementary particles get their mass. So, you know, I hope I um, convinced you that it's either the idea or the uh, experiment or the tool that gives you, uh, you know, um, appreciation if you want to be a scientist, all right? Now, one of these guys is odd man out because uh, he, the, could, could you tell me which one of these here kind of doesn't fit? 
you know, I, I told you, so it's either the idea or experiment or, but there is one guy here who just, there's something wrong about him. Okay, it's Freud, of course, it's always Freud. See, Karl Popper is a philosopher of science and he argued that all properly scientific theories must be potentially falsifiable. So, if you are offering a new idea, you have to also offer a way to falsify, not just to prove it, because you can't ever prove anything. You know, you can see something 10,000 times and think this must be right, but then 10,000 first time, it doesn't happen and immediately the whole thing uh, goes, and, and you have to develop another theory to, to figure out why it, 10,000 first time it didn't happen. So obviously your theory was partial theory which worked for 10,000 times, but obviously there's also something bigger which you didn't take into account, which uh, you know um, uh, happened 10,000 first and it doesn't fit your theory anymore. All right? So you have to present your work in a falsifiable form. But Freud, Freud was so smart that he presented all his theories in unfalsifiable form. So you can't ever design an experiment to disapprove his, uh, his, all his work. So all his work, it's a beautiful uh, theory, it's a beautiful concept, it's internally consistent, but you can't design an experiment to show that it's not true what he said. And in Myth of Framework, uh, Popper writes that every scientist who claims that his theory is supported by experiment or observation should describe any possible result or observation or experiment which, if reached, would refute the theory. This not, does not imply that the irrefutable theories are false, so it doesn't mean that Freud, Freud is not right. It just means that his theory lies outside of the field of empirical science. So we can't do anything scientific to prove them or disprove them, right? Now, let me try to uh, re, uh, reiterate how important senses are, because the only way we can do science is to you know, use our senses to observe the nature and then try to make sense of it, right? So if you want to get a Nobel Prize, you should probably study senses, because uh, eye and vestibular and hearing and uh, eye and visual and olfactory all explanation of how senses work in the first place in the molecular uh, level already uh, you know are always a winner with the Nobel Prize because it's already interesting but then if you can extend the sense um, uh, then you can do even uh, better for example I'll just show you this is just for the improvements of microscopes so uh, you know improvements of our ability to see small things these are the Nobel Prizes that were given just for you know doing generating ultra microscope which was able to study objects below the wavelength of light or phase contract or electron or scanning tunneling microscope so basically anytime you can develop a tool extend our senses that's a very good idea to do because that's how we do science and that's what we need to do science Okay, so interestingly, in a traditional or hypothesis-driven science, researchers are not expected to prove their hypothesis. No, because the hypothesis can never really be proven to be correct, no matter how much supporting information and evidence you are generating. Because as I said, 10,000 times, but 10,000 first and all goes, and you, you need another hypothesis to fit this observation in. So all that you can reasonably do is gather enough information that would convince other researchers that it would be entirely irrational to continue to support any alternative hypothesis. So all our knowledge is generated, all the knowledge, all, everything that we call knowledge today, is actually generated through double negative, showing that a non-idea is not true. So that's what's required to generate a positive result in science. Not to show that your idea is true, because you can't, but to convince people that a non-idea is not true is enough to push science forward, all right? So the famous p-value is simply the probability that the null hypothesis is true given the observations, so that the non-idea is true, right? So sometimes it's declared rational to reject the null hypothesis, which is a non-idea, when its probability drops below 5%. So if the probability of non-idea drops below the 5%, then you can say, oh, okay, the idea must be true, or let's agree, let's all agree. So knowledge is simply a prevailing agreement between most living scientists on the model that does better than the others to explain all the information that you've gathered. But never, none of them ever explain it perfectly. We, we have fantastic uh, models now to explain the universe and how it uh, works and so on, but it still doesn't encounter for a lot of things that we're seeing. For example, for the starters, the, its mass, uh, you know, 97% we don't know where it is. So 
they're talking about dark energy, dark matter. So gravity, where it comes from, who knows? Anyway, um, knowledge hardly ever is something that we can consider absolute or inflexible. So don't ever think that you know anything. And this is what it takes you, you know, 20 years of scientific career and hundreds of papers to start questioning the things that you just used as a knowledge when you were young so that you can actually even move anywhere. But then you get to the stage where you realize how it's all relative and fluid and evolves over time and it's always challenged by at least some people. And therefore it's often temporary in nature until a better explanation of all observation is proposed. So then you can ask yourself, why is it necessary to falsify the null hypothesis almost to the value of zero before we can accept your own idea. So why do we have to show that the probability of a non-idea is almost zero before your idea can be accepted? Why, why wouldn't your idea be accepted if you show that it's 75% likely that it's true and 20% likely that it's not? Well, why is this not enough? Well, the knowledge that humanity collectively generated is considered almost sacred and you only change it for a very, very good reason. It's very difficult and expensive to conduct experiments in science and therefore it's far worse to accept a new hypothesis that is not true or to make type 1 error and mislead the whole community. It's like taking a wrong turn on the highway. No one wants to take a wrong turn when you're somewhere in Germany, you know, among all these Dieselders and Essens and Hamburgs and Bremens and all those, and, and then take a wrong turn because you don't know and, and, and you, you're going to end up losing hours. You can always take a next turn or the next turn when you're absolutely sure. So, you know, uh, uh, it is less costly to reject a new hypothesis or new idea which is true to commit to the type 2 error because then other people will see, hmm, okay, we can't completely accept the new idea because it was 75% likely. But let's add a little bit more information. Let's, let's redo the experiment in another setting. You know, so over time, if this is true, it is, it's going to emerge. It, you, we don't have to rush science. And this is another thing that young scientists don't understand. They, they see something and then they want to have it published in Nature next week, um, uh, regardless of whether they're, uh, you know, absolutely certain or not. Look, publish it somewhere small just so that you claim that you were the first one to, to see it and then nobody's going to attack you and you won't have the whole world, you know, turn against you. So publish it, patent in a way the idea, but then continue to generate more and more evidence until you're absolutely sure and then you can, uh, uh, you know, so, so it's not so costly to wait for an idea because science is very slow and pathetically slow actually and, and people don't change ideas even in, in the face of evidence, it takes them years to really accept the ideas. Think about, talk to Adrian Bird and epigenetics, you know, and all these people who came up with ideas that nobody uh, believed. So now everybody believes it, it thinks it's phenomenal. But uh, then, you know, people were like, what? So uh, this is why Nobel Prizes you get like 25 years after your discovery, not, not uh, next year, which you should probably. So anyway, Ronald Fisher in the design of experiments said that no hypothesis can ever be proven, but the null hypothesis is possibly disproved in the course of experiments, and he always ad advocated this conservative approach to advancement of science. But this is a slow and in inefficient way to generate knowledge. You always have to design an experiment big enough to reject the uh, you know, uh, non-idea and convince everybody, and if it doesn't work, then you have to redo it, and so on and so on. So Neyman and Person uh, were actually concerned with one-sidedness of that whole uh, thing because it is so much in favor of, of uh, protecting the null hypothesis. So they uh, offered something else and, and this, is a big, this is the biggest thing that happened in statistics probably in the last uh, century. They said, look, why don't we just uh, uh, accelerate the development of science by uh, uh, contrasting null hypothesis with an alternative, seeing what, which one is more likely, uh, looking at the effect size more rather than just the p uh, value, and then just specifying the likelihood of error that we're making every time we, uh, we do this. So um, 
so that's how, I mean, although Fisher was strongly against this, he says, no, we, we, we should be conservative, we, we shouldn't be doing this, uh, we, we're going to have so many false positive findings. But actually, the community has now really accepted this uh, view, and uh, at the moment they're using a combination of the two, which is you're going to see in most papers. You're going to see the beta, you're going to see the effect size and the likelihood of uh, you know, error or some confidence interval, which is coming from these guys. And you're also going to see the p-value, uh, which is coming from um, this guy, so, or, or even guys before him. So basically, at the moment, we're kind of helping each other uh, and ourselves by trying to do both, okay? We're still mindful of p-values, but we're trying to use it together with looking at effect size and the uh, errors and so on and so on. So if you think about it, you know, uh, this is very relevant to to, to the GVAS I'll mention later, you know, you can, you can have something like this. You can have a predictor and outcome variable and think that, that one somehow influences the other. And if you see something like this, your P is not going to be significant because you can't be sure that whether there's anything here. And, and your effect size is obviously very small. But here, so don't, don't get fooled by this situation because this is what we have in GVAS so often. We have, a, we have highly significant P. They're almost all lying on a on, um, uh, on the straight line. So, so surely there must be a phenomenal correlation between the predictor and the outcome. Yes, but, but the effect size is ridiculously uh, small. So yes, they, they do, uh, they are connected somehow, but uh, the effect is very small. So don't get excited with the p-value. Huge p-value can mean all sorts of things. P-value is only there to protect you from making, uh, from, from the chance effects and nothing else. There could be a bias, there could be some confounding variable that you are not taking into account and, and or some artifact which can make something seems phenomenally correlated but this was because that was dropped in the lab and everything in that tube which you measure is now looking the same with everything else in that tube, right? So, so you know, uh, so that p-value, don't, don't take a p-value because I, I can see that so many people in, even in the, uh, who are doing these uh, studies talk about, oh, this is a huge p-value so it must be extremely important. No, p-value is great, it's important because it's, uh, it's clearly connected but you don't know why it's connected, it may be an artifact. Uh, whereas I'd much rather see also in, in addition to p-value a large effect size. That would convince me far more than just a p-value. Uh, here you have a large effect size but only four observations so p-value can't possibly be high because you add one more dot here, here and all of a sudden you uh, hardly have anything at all, um, right? So, but you, you see this for thing and also, oh, this something happened here but anyway, this is how we look at the genotypes, you know, uh, homozygous for one allele, homozygous for other, and heterozygous, you know, you can have a nice uh, situations where, you know, the effect is small but the p-value is high, or effect is large but the p-value is small. So don't, don't, you know, distinguish those two always. Don't think that high p-value, that's, that's everything. P-value is only there to protect you from chance effects. And you can protect yourself from chance effects by, by doing everything nice and well and nicely and, and having a huge sample size. If you have a huge sample size and you've done everything by the book, then you don't even have to measure the p-value. Who cares? The, what you need to care is whether there's any bias that you're not taking into account or any confounding that you're not taking into account. P-value is just protecting you from chance. All right. So, now let's talk, this was all hypothesis-driven science. This was all about hypothesis-driven science. But now I want to propose something else, but I have no idea where I have any time left, so I'll check. What's that? Oh, hmm, it's not as bad, or it, this is completely wrong, wait. Mm, num, 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 num. So what is the time? It's 3.28. When did I start? So, 10 more minutes? Um, okay, even so, 12. even 12, okay, so guys, if, if, you, if you, you know, I mean, this could be a talk about hypothesis driven science and that's it, but I would like to propose that something new is happening with science and that is a hypothesis free science and this is fundamentally different than everything that we've ever been doing and I'm not sure that everybody realizes it actually. So we'll consider an example of biomedical science in the post genome era. In 21st century, biotechnology industry made large progress in standardizing the way in which human biological material should be collected, handled, analyzed, and stored. And this made studies of those materials uh, comparable internationally, so that's great. 
Guidelines have been developed for long-term storage of body fluids and freezing them at low temperature, and the same is true for specific tissues and cell lines. So now, I think that there were three big building blocks that enabled hypothesis-free science. So the first building block is the development of human biobanks. They are usually defined as biorepositories that store biological samples for use in research in a completely same uh, standardized way. The second building block is high throughput measurement. So high throughput measurement of biological materials that are stored in these biobanks, which is the actually automation of experiments and analysis such that large scale repetition in short amount of time becomes feasible. So you need to generate enormous amount of information from enormous amount of stored data. We never had these large sample sizes before. We never had this capacity to analyze all this in such a, a fast uh, way. And then most importantly, this rise of computers and information technology because biobanks and high throughput analytic methods generate so much information on the structure and function of the human organisms that only computers are able to store this and analyze this and the, it was the development of computers that actually um, uh, you know enabled this. So imagine 20 years ago we really didn't have uh, computers, we, there, we had those cards that were punched and, and if you wanted to do anything beyond the, the uh, Fisher's chi-square test or uh, student's t-test, you had to go to these huge computers and they would run for weeks and you would do a factor analysis or uh, you know multiple regression uh, for your PhD and you would have to pay for that and that was it. Now we can do on the laptop all sorts of stuff, right? So, the revolution of computer processing capacity allowed testing of thousands of hypotheses in the short time in hundreds of thousands of examinees, each with enormous amount of information. And the statistical techniques are rapidly emerging, thanks to crazy people like Yuri, to address these problems most effectively while minimizing the required computer processing capacity. So, in hypothesis-free research, researchers never developed any hypothesis because they don't based on some existing knowledge because they don't need to. So we came to the time in the history of science where we don't have to have any knowledge, pre-existing knowledge. I don't know anything about human biology or human biochemistry or genes or anything. But I came to these islands with Osrin and my uncle and we you know, just measured everything perfectly, stored everything perfectly, uh, then sent it to some lab for high throughput analysis, then put it into computer and programmed the computer to find any associations between anything in there. So we don't know anything about you know, medicine or this or that, but we did that and uh, we have confidence that we've done it correctly. And what happens? Computer does the science. So computer tests millions of hypotheses one by one because it's programmed to do that and gives us the p-value of what uh, you know um, is happening. All right. So the positive finding can be demonstrated beyond reasonable doubt in hypothesis free science because p-values are huge but the researchers will not understand what is the underlying mechanism. So it's going to tell you that some crazy molecule uh, is associated with some gene that you've never heard of but, and it is certain, it is more certain than th that the universe exists, you know, but, you know, it's P of uh, less than 10 to the minus 205 we got in one study, right? So 200 zeros. But, so, so we have complete certainty that these two things must be uh, somehow associated with each other. But we have no idea why. So this is the big new change. Because before in hypothesis driven science you had to understand everything and then use it to develop uh, an idea and then test the idea. Now we get the answers before we ever asked the questions. And we get the correct answers every time because it wins every time. Every time the p value is big enough or small enough we got a correct answer, but we never <laughs> asked the question, we never developed the hypothesis. So, because you don't know the underlying mechanism, it's difficult to have faith in a positive result and pursue it um, a, a explanation. And statistical text only protects us against chance, but not bias and confounding. So this may be, you, you may now start pursuing something interesting that's correlated, but it may have all been due to some laboratory mistake or something. So. The, the hypothesis driven researchers are far more driven because they believe in the knowledge they have and they believe in their idea and then they're happy to pursue it. Here it's difficult to pursue something because you have to do science backwards. You get the correct answer but you have to work backwards like Sherlock Holmes what was actually the question and what's in between. And uh, 
to, to commit time to that, you have to have complete confidence in that result. And you can't because there's something could have gone wrong in the laboratory. So it's really a completely different kind of, of science. And once we find a striking association, this is not the end of the research, but the beginning. We need to work backwards um, um, to ask the questions. And now just a little bit about how it's all now working. And I think that the best example of this hypothesis free science is the uh, post-genome era and genome-wide association studies, which Yuri and I are so fond of. So um, uh, in 2001, Clinton invited these two guys, uh, uh, Craig Venter and uh, Francis Collins, who led private and public effort to sequence the human uh, genome. And these two uh, are hugely influential. And what can we do now thanks to that? We can take on one side, we can measure some diseases in people. We can, we can develop huge biobanks, measure diseases, measure quantitative traits, measure omics, measure even at cellular level some expression signaling pathway cell metabolism. So those are the things that we see are happening, but we would like to know why are they happening and what actually influences somebody to get a disease or to have high blood pressure or to have high or strange lipidomics profile or glycomics or, or to have differences in expression. So how can we do that now? Well, we can just measure it in 100,000 people and we can then in 100,000 people look at the variation in the genetic code. And that variation in the genetic code, there are different ways we, they, we can look at them. They could be common sequence variants, they can be so basically just a, a one letter changed and there are many of those. Then they can be structural variants like you have re repeating sequences or you can have very rare variants uh, or methylation or um, whole uh, genome sequence. So you can, you can use all these things to correlate. You can correlate each one of those things with each one of those things without knowing anything, all right, and find correlations, associations beyond reasonable doubt. So expectations of human genome projects is to do just that, to somehow, without knowing anything in between, to generate a masses of discovery by just simply putting it all into computer now and you know, linking genes and diseases. You have to remember what I said about the explosion of science. It happens when you can measure something. We couldn't measure uh, human inherited uh, material. We could have measured smoking, uh, you know, we could have measured height or, or um, something that we were eating, uh, and then we can correlate that to diseases. But we couldn't measure anything genetically. We could maybe do twin studies and that's, or inbreeding studies, and that's about it. But now suddenly in 2001, we, we could measure genetics of a human far more precisely than we can measure anything else on a human, actually. And now we expected that, you know, linking this to uh, that would uh, generate masses of new knowledge without actually knowing why. So we needed technological breakthrough to do that and these two companies have actually provided chips that were able to do this high throughput stuff. And this was in 2006 time when we were asking about uh, Illumina or Affymetrics for the Eurospan project and Hari and Yuri and I were sitting around the table calling people whether to buy Affymetrics or Illumina uh, genome-wide scan products and chips and this was here, right? And uh, then I s everybody said, look guys, Affymetrics doesn't work uh, by Illumina and Affymetrics was trading at the stock in New York at about $90 uh, per share, whereas Illumina was about $4 per share. But we had information that Illumina is better than Affymetrics. And I told Hari, look, let's all put 10,000 euros into Illumina because this must, you know, give us some um, uh, profit. And uh, he said, oh, yeah, right, I'm going to lose all the money. I'm, if I put any money in the stock market, the whole stock market will crash, you know, immediately. But look, although the stock market did crash <laughs> here and here, actually, if you put 10,000 here, you know, guess what we'd have? It went up like 20 uh, times. So uh, silly Harry discouraged me from investing in um, Illumina. Anyway, so um, we could have, I could have had another cows in split. <laughs> anyway, so uh, this is what, what this hypothesis-free approach actually when you use a Illumina or Affymetrics chip does. See, these are chromosomes. The red is chromosome 1, blue is chromosome 2, pink is chromosome 3, blah, blah, blah. So on each chromosome you have many, many of these dots. These are markers. So uh, you have 300,000 of these markers here. 
and this is a p-value, so this is a negative logarithm uh, of the p-value. So obviously um, this is p less than 10, uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 and so on and so on. This is seven zeros and so on. So um, the trouble is when you're using 300,000 markers, you're doing many multiple tests. So you have to adjust for that. We use Bonferroni correction for that. And then when you see something above this red line, that's already interesting, but you would expect with 300,000 markers, you would expect to find three or four or uh, two by chance here. And these, these dots, these markers on this chromosome and this chromosome and this chromosome and these chromosomes are probably here just by chance because we tested 300,000 of them. But when you get something this high, then you can be very, very convinced that on the chromosome one, two, three, four, there is a cluster of markers with increasingly high p-value that in this set of individuals they're connected with something and in this case this was uric acid. So this is an SLC2A9 gene, then you work from there, you expand that whole chromosome, okay this is another example, chromosome 5 in this case uh, looked interesting and then they looked what happened, this is chromosome 5, this marker was implicating this region, so they expanded that region and they found the gene CD H10 and CDH9 to be, you know, involved with the trait here, which I think was autism. So, um, so this is how we do it. We, we uh, you know, we take uh, groups of cases and controls, compare their markers. They're all pretty much the same, apart from the gene which must be different and somehow mutated in those who are uh, affected with the disease. And this is how the whole discovery using hypothesis-free science worked. So in 2000, there was only one gene uh, that was uh, associated with a disease that was PPR um, um, gamma, and you can see it was associated with type 2 diabetes, then in 2001 only two, and so on and so on. But then with the uh, Illumina and Affymetrix chips, you know, from 2006, we had this explosion and it's still going on. We have thousands and thousands of genes which have been assigned their biomedical function. So the whole thing has really been assigning biomedical function to different genetic variants to different genes. That's what genome-wide association studies have done. And to convince you that this is a successful uh, kind of science, uh, you I took na a top uh, most cited papers from uh, year 2007 in Nature, and Nature contains all science, and you can see that six out of top ten are having to do with genome-wide association studies. Science 2007 again, and it hasn't changed that much even up to date. So it's been a ridiculously interesting and successful uh, in all world science. You know, these people who have joined forces like Yuri and I and, and developed this consortia have emerged as, you know, d doing something really interesting that other people really find uh, worthwhile uh, citing. So what makes technology-driven and hypothesis-free research appealing? It's virtually free of human bias. What I didn't tell you, that at the same time, at the same time here, there were thousands of papers claiming that through case control design and looking at their favorite gene and their favorite disease, they have found a positive uh, association. But none of those thousands and thousands and thousands of papers that were appearing in 2001, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 have been replicated, whereas all of these genes have been uh, uh, replicated. So this is telling you that 99% of you know, uh, papers in the literature that appeared from 1999 to 2006, 99.9% .9 of papers were wrong. They, they were completely, you know, 99% of papers linking genes to diseases were wrong because, you know, people had their hypothesis. You can find all those publications. Uh, look at any, you know, anything non-genome by association study designed that claims that this gene causes this trait or this disease. It's going to be wrong. They took like 50 people, uh, you know, with a disease and 50 without a disease that was underpowered, uh, they looked at the variants in the gene here and there, and that was underpowered. They were, they were just all false positive findings. Out of 20 groups that looked, uh, the, uh, you know, one would find it because they used the threshold P005. And um, uh, so this, this tells you that, uh, you know, the, the researchers want to even cheat because that even isn't explicable by just many, you know, trials and errors. That, that was just a blatant cheating. They just wanted to show to the world that, I don't know, this gene is connected to that thing because they think this, this must be the case. So that means that humans are wrong 99% of the times. Only these few people 
this, 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 and this was right, and that was in the period before um, Jivas, and then Jivas started here, and look at that, this is all replicated, and then there is a huge mountain, you know, in the following years of genes associated with different uh, diseases here, right? Okay, and, um, and this is uh, the Brave New World study in 2007. This was a landmark study when Wellcome Trust Case Control uh, Consortium looked at uh, 2,000 individuals with sever seven major diseases, and they had a shared set of 3,000 controls, and they found um, 24 signals, and this was the first time that everybody was convinced that this is going to work. And this is now, uh, everything else is not that uh, relevant. So I think this was the time when uh, people got convinced that this is going to work. And, and everything that happens ever since has also, you know, proved that this is the case. The problem is that we're not really, unfortunately, translating any of that yet into um, benefit for the humanity. But I, I would be amazed that none of this eventually gets used. We're still in early stages and people are already impatient. They were saying, but they were telling for years, this is not going to work, this is not going to work, this is not going to work, this can't possibly work, this is not going to work. And now that it's working and everybody is amazed that it's actually working, now they're saying like, oh, where are the results? Where is the translation? Where is the implementation? So don't mind what everybody is talking. They're just talking nonsense, okay? Just trust Everybody, if you know, if, if a majority is saying something, they must be uh, wrong. You know, if something is popular, it must be wrong. So just, uh, uh, um, I mean, look at Justin Bieber and stuff. So, um, um, so just uh, trust your common sense. And uh, you see, these groups here trusted their common sense. And although everybody said, oh, how can you do this? That's not going to work. Bad. No hypothesis, no idea. But actually, we have assigned. Pro probably just the resource we have in Croatia has been involved in assigning uh, biomedical function to more than uh, probably 600 human genes to date. So, so that's, that's not bad you know, for us here in, um, in this small and uh, reasonably poor country. Okay, so that's it. If you have any more questions, please uh, let me know. Sorry that I kept you here for so long, but I thought if I'm doing this on my holiday, I uh, either, <laughs> either, either do it right or not to do it at all. So I thought I'd, I'd just try to, to you know, tell you, uh, you know, to teach you something, uh, not amuse you. I could have amused you for half an hour and that could have worked too. Anyway, so questions? Yep? That's a beautiful question. Look at how many hypotheses. I'm fooling you all because look at how many hypotheses I'm actually doing. I'm doing the hypothesis that the variation in the DNA will have some. I'm testing the hypothesis the variation in DNA will have something to do with the variation I see in uric acid, right? I'm making a hypothesis that you know the uh, the chips that I selected uh, for this and the common variants that we selected for this are actually the ones which are going to harbor uh, all the uh, you know important uh, diversity. I'm making an assumption that I uh, measured precisely the disease with the methods that I used. Okay, so that's all true. I am, of course, testing several hypotheses there. But what's completely different, what's fundamentally different, is that I don't know what I'm uh, looking for. Yes, I'm not, I'm, I didn't develop an idea based on the knowledge that I had. That's the key difference, well, right? Well, the fundamental knowledge that there is some kind of, should be some kind of association what you can find in a genome and some, some specific traits. Okay, okay, fair enough. Also, you, you as a biological person probably don't have any hypothesis, but a data analysis person needs to have hypothesis because if, if you're going to make this feasible, and you want to do it in a computer in a normal time, you need to reduce your hypothesis set, let's say. You need to create some hypothesis. So from the perspective of data analysis people, they always use hypothesis. Mm. You cannot just take 300,000 counts and then do classification on leave one out principle. It's not feasible. But see, for me, that would be far, far more attractive because uh, I have... Mean, <laughs> no, no, I, 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 I see what you're saying. So much. Yes, but look. Uh, it was completely unfeasible to do any of uh, this uh, 10 years ago or five years ago. But uh, if I show you a little bit more, you know, maybe... Uh, okay, that's all nothing. So, 
Uh, okay. <laughs> this is what I didn't tell you, all right? So, <laughs> so look, I mean, look, in, in, in 1989, the cost of sequencing of one base pair were projected to fall below one dollar, and this is when the Human Genome Project started with three billion dollars. Uh, and uh, uh, look at this, this is how much uh, uh, has it gone, uh, the, the se sequencing capacity has, so within 23 years, sequencing capacity increased by eight orders of magnitude and the cost decreased by five to six orders of magnitude. And in fact, uh, you're right, computing power is what doesn't match acceleration in capacity to sequence genomes and uh, generate data. So if you wanted to do a GVAS of a QT of 10,000 examinees about two or three years ago, you would require a computer that can run a thousand times faster than today's uh, fastest. So, um, so it's true that now, I mean, the genotyping costs are going down so much and, and the capacity to, geno to generate data is going up so much that you, we are able to generate far more data than the computers can handle. So you're right in a way that it would be great to now uh, focus on a few areas. My problem is that I know that 99% of everything that people thought of uh, was wrong, okay? So, uh, so I would rather uh, trust a computer scientist performing for a long time systematically every single analysis, then I would be telling him, I think this is uh, you know, important and this is not worth studying because that's the best way to, to, to make a disastrous uh, mistake. I think we are making a, a progress towards an area of where science will be doing, done in a uh, much more systematic uh, way than uh, just you know, following many ideas by uh, many people. Uh, I think it worked so far, but, it was, uh, but, but it's gonna be so much better if we could really you know, just take the whole genome, scan everything, have all the information, then uh, you know, correlate everything to everything else. That is uh, gonna bring far more data than maybe humans collectively would think of, uh, or far more knowledge that humans collectively would create in the next 100 years if they were just following their um, ideas. So I, I, I really believe that with the, and now computing capacity is increasing all the time. People are now developing these quantum computers. They just model, model the brain, uh, you know, uh, wiring uh, in the recent nature, uh, developed computers based on the, uh, how brain is wired and increased the capacity by hundreds of thousands uh, of times. So using synapses and, and stuff. So, um, so computing will get there, you know. This is just a phase when it's all based on silicon, but they will get there. Quantum computing and all this, uh, uh, you know, and, and people like Yuri will also m improve the, you know, the, the time and the capacity by using better statistical tools. So, you know, I think it's better to wait for us to be able to do everything systematically than to still trying to do, um, you know, things based on my perception of the literature on uh, lipids or glycans or I don't know cancer or this I don't ha I have a very limited perception uh, uh, I mean knowledge and, and so does everybody else so uh, it's a lot better to let computers do this systematically and tell us what's right and what's wrong that's that's my uh, personal uh, take on this because and it's only because I've seen how ridiculously wrong was it when we let people test their own ideas it was just wrong plain wrong you know just everybody was wrong pretty much Yes. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> I know. I, I come. <laughs> I I completely agree with you guys. I, I really do. I mean, uh, of course, you have to make an assumption whether something is linear or Poisson or this or that, but I mean. Unfortunately, I still believe that far more than I believe humans doing science and accepting science. And also, it's going to help things be accepted much faster because if I say this and I believe this and I demonstrate it, people are not going to you know, believe me. Uh, but if, if a computer based on million uh, you know, people sample size and the computations and using methods that evolved and they're all working and everything is replicable, then, then at least we're going to accept it far faster and, and have it translated. Uh, and, and then pharmaceutical industry is really, you know, we do have a pipeline and pharma industry are constantly looking at these GVAS studies and, and putting people on anything that looks interesting to, to follow it through because the fact that something is just associated and doesn't explain much variation doesn't say anything about its pharmaceutical potential. When you look at statins, which were the biggest drug of the 
uh, last 50 uh, years, uh, the, the hit for uh, cholesterol that on which statin action is based was number seven by p-value and effect size. But it's, it must be some very, very critical pathway which we, we don't really understand that is actually, you know, if you block it, then you block a lot of stuff that happens downstream and all these genes that... Yes, you're right. So basically, uh, the way, you know, so, so this is what has become a norm in genome-wide association studies. So you, you find the correlation between a variant in the, um, or association between the variant in the genome and some, uh, some uh, trait of a human, right? Okay, but then it could all be completely wrong or confounded. So you firstly, the first step is to replicate it in a completely different, uh, uh, you know, biobank. So this is why we all need each other and we find something in this and we try to replicate it in Orkney and then it must be true for the whole Europe. But then even that is not enough. Now what's asked is that we conduct experiments and that we uh, take mice or some uh, other experimental organisms and that we actually shut down deliberately that uh, the, the expression of that gene and the, or, or just uh, get it out of the genome and then see whether the phenotype gets affected. So only that is really establishing the cause-effect relationship because association never tells you anything about cause and effect. It can be causality, it can be reverse causality. In fact, you know, um, uh, you can find low cholesterol in people with heart disease because firstly they had heart, uh, high cholesterol, then developed heart disease, then got statins, and then if you uh, now go and do the study of people who had myocardial infarction and look at their cholesterol, they're actually going to have a lot lower cholesterol than the rest of the population. So it's a completely reverse uh, causality. Uh, it's because of the treatment. So, you know, you, you can't work away um, um, those uh, problems unless you do the follow-up functional experiments when you say, okay, I think this gene comes first and its activity and that expression eventually affects the phenotype. Now let's shut down the gene, all right? and uh, uh, let's see what happens to the phenotype. And then you breed mice or, or some worms or uh, yeast or whatever experimental organism you think is useful. And then you show that this really is true. And luckily a lot of genome is conserved between us and these experimental organisms. So sometimes the same uh, genes still do the same uh, tricks. So um, you can do that actually. So you basically propose hypothesis free science as a generator for hypothesis Exactly. Science. Yes, absolutely. I'm, it's, I'm so glad that you, <laughs> that you got, that said that because that is exactly what I'm saying. So I'm saying that instead of thinking with our limited... On the with a beer, no, you better do abso free absolutely. Do a hypothesis free science, look at what's the, what the correct answers are and then try to guess the questions and then do the proper hypothesis uh, driven science. So that's exactly what I'm uh, saying. It, it's going to increase efficiency uh, by, uh, you know, a light years uh, if, if we do science, start doing science that way. So this should be hypothesis generating step and then from this hypothesis free, let's then start knowing the right answer, let's start generating hypothesis and then prove that this is true and why, why is it true. Okay? Yeah? It is the same thing here. <laughs> so personalized and uh, realized. So basically, it's the same. Uh, so so it, is, it, is, it means just that, that we should do medicine by not trying to uh, develop drugs or treatments that uh, are going to be given to many people, but actually take the human and look at the profile and uh, understand particular reasons for the particular phenotype or disease, and then give them only stuff that is going to help them, but not necessarily other. Uh, people, because everybody gets their own disease for their own uh, reasons. Yeah. One comment. <laughs> yes. You have these uh, three ways to be a successful scientist. Yep. And then, okay, I'm going a little bit to other direction, dimension, but I think it's uh, like absolutely critical uh, what was not on your slides is Okay, you could develop technology, you have right ideas, but if you cannot effectively communicate it, you mm. lack marketing skills, 
<laughs> okay, so I did have on my slide that you have to go back to the tribe and communicate your uh, uh, thing to the rest of the tribe and convince them. Uh, uh, so communication is hugely important. Luckily, you know, scientists are very poor uh, or even disinterested in communicating their stuff to general public and, and there is a breed of scientists who write popular science books who are a lot better than that but they're not necessarily the best uh, uh, scientists. But uh, what I think helps is the fact that we have the structure of these impact factors, although everybody hates impact factor and so on. You know, at least one thing is true, which is that if you, um, uh, if you have a paper and publish it in a high uh, impact journal, people will see it. So you, did, you communicated it to many, many people uh, by just doing a good science. Now, whether you meant can you actually explain what you've done, uh, uh, in, if that's what you meant by communicating, you still have scientific writers. So you, you, you now have professional scientific writers. So if you're pathetic at organizing your thoughts, but you, you do see clearly that you have uh, some result, you can hire a scientific writer and they give them the results and work with him for a few hours to explain what it is. And then the professional scientific writer writes a paper, it gets submitted to nature, it gets accepted to nature, and then you do communicate your work and there's even a press release with, with your paper. So it's, it's kind of automated, it's, it's, uh, but, but I, I know what you're saying. If you do, I mean, there are some people who have done extremely well <laughs> advocating and advertising their work, where some people are pathetic at uh, that, although they're fantastic uh, scientists. But luckily, you know, it's us who can tell the difference. Who cares whether some cleaning lady here, uh, well, not to, to, you know, uh, <laughs> that I have anything um, against cleaning ladies, they're all extremely uh, needed, um, um, and so are many other people. But um, uh, you know, uh, who cares whether they understand? We understand uh, who does something good and who doesn't. So that's, that's what I think people should, yeah. Uh, but I think now so much is published that, uh, yeah, if you come like, I don't know, 30 years ago, you have only a few journals in your field and you could really read all the aspects. <sighs> yeah, and but... Then, uh, Communicating your research becomes more and more important. And communicating to your peers is the first line. I'm not talking mm. about society. Exactly. That you know people who are specialists in your narrow field, which is by now thousands of people. Yes, know, yes. Narrow field, yes. That they are aware if you do something important, you need to effectively communicate. But right. if it's really important. You need to write your paper you go clearly, to, you need to yes, go to yes. meetings. Uh, they have just, yeah, they have just proposed... You can't just make the discovery and then... No. Okay, so there, there are three in indexes that you should know because they're going to become very important in your time, uh, which measure scientific performance. So Hirsch index, age index, is the most important. It's brilliant. I think it beautifully brings together somebody's effort that they invested and then the level of intelligence. So that's, that measures in one number both the quantity and the quality of your... Uh, publications, which I think is great because most of us uh, know that eventually for a big discovery, more than anything, you do need a bit of luck, all right? And you can't just, you know, hope that you're going to be that lucky, all right? So, um, so Hirsch Index at least, you know, takes luck out of equation if you published many papers and if many of them have been uh, highly cited, then Hirsch Index is going to capture uh, this in one number. So that's, that's beautiful. Uh, uh, then there is E index, which is Einstein index, which is um, indicative of get somebody getting a Nobel Prize. So it only looks at the three papers that you were the leading author, first or last, and uh, the, uh, that were the most highly cited. So if you had three papers from the same area, which got cited like a thousand times each, that is very indicative that you're going to get some big prize. So that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, you, you may never publish anything else. If you know these two guys in, uh, in, in, in Perth, Australia, these were two pathologists in a local hospital, and one of them was convinced that the peptic ulcer disease, you know, is caused by a bacteria. And that's ridiculous because everybody thought when I was a medical student, we learned it was the disbalance between the production of acid and removal of acid. But he said, no, it's a, it's a bacteria. I can see it. And then he ingested himself with the bacteria to cause himself a pectic ulcer and treated himself with an antibiotic. And from that point onwards, you know, 84 
5% of peptic ulcers. So these guys have two papers that were cited 3,000 times each and no other, <laughs> or they have 15 other papers in like, you know, Australian Pathological Society presentations. So that, that's, that's the, you know, prize uh, index. And then there is the third index, which is a K index, which has just been proposed, which is a Kardashian index, which, um, which looks at the disproportion between your citations and your number of followers on Twitter and uh, uh, Facebook. So if you have many, uh, many, many more citations than followers on Twitter and Facebook, then y you have a very low Kardashian index. If you have a low citations and high number of followers, then you have a very high Kardashian index. So basically, you're known for nothing, right? For being known. Right, so, uh, uh, and you're making enormous uh, money of it usually. So basically, you have to decide which one of those you want because each one of those is achieved through a completely different way. E index, you have to be like Peter Higgs. He has six publications in his whole life. For years, he has been embarrassment to Edinburgh University's physics um, uh, department. Now he's the most famous physicist of our time, but they wanted to suck him so many times that it's ridiculous to say, but every time there would be something who said like, look, 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 who knows if these people at CERN actually find something, maybe we should wait because this guy could get a Nobel Prize. And luckily he didn't get sucked, right? So he went for E index, you know, I'm just going to think of one thing which is going to be important enough, even if it takes me 15 years, I'm going to do just one thing. I'm getting to that stage now because after so many papers, I don't see myself having uh, reached anywhere near anything important. So uh, I need to stop publishing papers and start thinking more and, and, and maybe have three or four more papers, but with a higher chance for E-index. Whereas I have a huge age index because I invested a lot of effort, so did Yuri, but um, uh, that's uh, very rewarding already, but it's even more if you have done something uh, now, Kardashian index is obviously something you have to spend a lot of time on Facebook and Twitter and, and then presenting and going around the world but, and talking about yourselves and your research. And Yuri is right. There are some people who are phenomenal at that, but not that much of the research in the research they are doing. So, yeah. <laughs>